Hey YouTubers! Today a lot of sh** pissed me off so you guys get to listen to it. His dad's not having a whole lot to do with this pregnancy and that sucks. I'm kind of screwed as far as dating goes because I date losers. She had something she wanted to tell me and um, she then disclosed that well um, somebody died because of something I did at work. I assumed it to be accidental and responded accordingly. And then she um, disclosed that it wasn't accidental. And then she disclosed that it wasn't just one. So do you think that, having said that, do you think it's better for you and your relationship with Matthew if she's with your dad full time? Um, well, we've actually been able to focus on our relationship instead of I'll constantly work looking over our shoulder at what she's gonna do next, what she's gonna destroy. You obviously have to be a psychopath to help carry out the murder of an innocent person. But you have to be even more of a psycho and honestly probably pretty stupid to plan out a murder and then pretend to be a victim and expect to get away with it. At least most of the time, law enforcement is going to see through your lies pretty quickly. That is what the people in these stories end up figuring out a little too late. The following stories tell the tale of three psychopath killers who tried to pretend to be victims and get caught red-handed. Stay tuned. I went downstairs and his face was covered in blood. Do you know what they were hitting him with? A gun! This is the story of a former YouTube star and a mother of five named Samantha Wolford. On February 20th of 2015, Samantha found herself in the middle of a horrific crime scene. She claimed that she had been sleeping in her bed when three masked men broke into the home she shared with her husband, a tattoo artist named Ernie Ibera and their children. I think you know exactly really who did, did this, and I think you're scared. She claimed that the masked men tied her up and gave her before then attacking her husband. He's saying that they hit her husband in the face about five times and took him out. But is she just the innocent victim that she's claiming to be or just a good liar? So walk me through what happened. I don't honestly know what happened. Okay. I was in bed asleep okay. and we heard a noise and the second I was able to open my eyes somebody grabbed me and jerked me out of the bed and slammed me down on the ground and started tying me up. As you can see from the body cam footage taken on the night of the supposed attack, Samantha seems very distressed and worked out. This is probably how most people would react if they had been asleep only to be awoken in the middle of the night to strangers attacking their family, but Samantha also seemed to have a pretty good recollection of what happened for someone who had just been through some pretty horrific trauma. She could remember in detail what the men had been wearing. They had black masks on, black shirts, black pants. Every inch of skin was covered. At first, this sounds like it could be a fairly typical home invasion situation. Then when they dragged me downstairs because they had him downstairs and they were separating us, I went downstairs and his face was covered in but it is what Samantha says that the masked men do next that I'll have you admit it's pretty strange. At one point, Samantha says they bring her downstairs and have a uh, her stand in front of him while they say, how can you not appreciate what you have here? You have this beautiful woman here. Why, how can you not appreciate this? How could he treat her so badly uh, that they exposed her? Samantha claimed that they continued to taunt her while being her husband. She said that they then tied him up and kidnapped him, taking him away somewhere, but she didn't know where. But why? What did this couple do to make anyone want to attack them in such a horrible, disgusting way? Let's take a look at how they met and what their relationship looked like to get an idea. The two met at a tattoo shop where Ernie worked and began dating in 2008. At the time, Samantha already had two children from another relationship. Her and Ernie go on to have three more children together before getting married in 2014. Things between the two of them sounded like they were pretty rocky. I don't think that uh, they had a very uh, good relationship. Uh, it looked to me like he was doing um, everything he could to keep uh, the family financially afloat. He was working two jobs. 
she was not working. It's hard to imagine being a young man still only in his 20s and going from having no children at all to being a father of five and the sole breadwinner for the family in a fairly short period of time. But that was the situation that Ernie found himself in and he was bound and determined to make it work. Samantha had her own dreams and aspirations that she wanted to work towards. I've always wanted to be an actress. I think it is so much fun one of the most amazing forms of art ever to be able to express yourself that way. Remember Samantha's dream about becoming an actress because it's going to be important later on in the story. One of the ways that Samantha was trying to make a name for herself was through posting YouTube videos online. Her content started out pretty much as your average how-to content or makeup tutorials, but as time went on, things got a lot darker and a lot more personal. She started complaining about things going on within her relationship. Hey YouTubers! Today a lot of shit pissed me off so you guys get to listen to it. His dad's not having a whole lot to do with this pregnancy and that sucks. I'm kind of screwed as far as dating goes because I date losers. Samantha really liked the idea that she could go online and talk about her life and people would be interested and wanted to hear what she had to say. I think this was a source of excitement for her and she wanted attention. The problem is, is that this really developed into this kind of tunnel vision for her. It was her only focus, and her family was really left to the wayside. Before long, Samantha was putting so much time and energy into trying to become a famous YouTube star that there wasn't really much left over for Ernie and the kids. What do you think of me making YouTube videos? Well, I guess I don't mind. It takes up a lot of time. It's understandable that Ernie started to feel like he was never her main focus. He started getting frustrated. <clears throat> Not gonna light a cigarette? Oh yeah, I forgot about him. Cause you got that f***ing iPad in your hands. Oh, where, 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 where? At least you're paying attention. But only because it's a hilarious episode. So clearly they had their problems, but so does any young couple. Still, this doesn't explain who might have been behind this attack. Law enforcement brought in Samantha to ask her about who she thought might have wanted to hurt Ernie. I feel like there's something he hasn't been telling me, but I don't know why. What you're gonna pay until you... I think it's something to do with his dad. This wasn't the first time since the attack that Samantha mentioned something about Ernie's dad. Let's take a look back at the body cam footage from the night that Ernie was kidnapped. Did you hear him say anything else besides yeah. what you told us? They said that it was because of his dad. And because of his dad? Yeah. Okay. And um, they said his dad knocked on someone and got their man thrown behind bars. And now they were taking revenge and taking someone from him. If what Samantha was talking about had any truth to it, this whole creepy situation had a lot more layers to it than it originally appeared to. His dad has a problem with getting involved in things we don't need to get involved with. Such a huge. But it doesn't take long for officers to become suspicious as they start to notice that certain things about Samantha's story just don't seem to be adding up. I'm not really seeing a whole lot of dough for somebody that was pistol whipped. Scene's not really making sense since No. Everybody's wearing all black. Black shoes, no identifying marks on them. But that's not even the sketchiest thing about this whole story. One thing that was especially weird was the fact that 911 wasn't the first call that Samantha made on the night that she claimed her husband was attacked and kidnapped. She called her mother first. If your husband had just been taken by a bunch of masked strangers and you thought that there was a good chance his life was on the line, wouldn't 911 be one of the first things on your mind too? Apparently, it wasn't for Samantha. And that's not the only question. Samantha told detectives that the masked men gagged her and tied her up. If that was true, then how did she even call her mom in the first place? Instead of calling 911 for help, you called your mother? How did you press 911 with your face? Well, how did you dial your mother with your face? I didn't dial my mother. I just pushed the first thing that was on there. It had just happened to be my mom. So obviously this doesn't sound very realistic, but it could still be possible. The detectives tried to turn up the pressure for Samantha by letting her know that he doesn't believe that she is telling the truth. I think the story's made up about, about the, the, well, your daddy, his daddy, and, and, and stuff like that. I, I think, you know, I think you know exactly really who did, did this, 
And I think you're scared. Keep in mind that Samantha wants to be an actress and thinks she's pretty good at it, so she probably thinks she has been more convincing so far with her story than she really has been. The only other thing. Okay, see, I knew. You know, you know, Sam, you know I'm not here lying to you. You know I know. He is trying to see if this may help her to pull some information out of Samantha, but is it going to work? Or does she just have what sounds like more lies up her sleeve? <laughs> I think I can go on to the message parlor. Okay. And she's got a guy there and I swear to God, I cannot go up there that I said any of this. Okay. <laughs> because they have a lot of friends around here and my life will be in a lot of danger. Basically, Samantha says that she opened up to some people about how Ernie had been treating her, and this male friend she had told him that he would deal with the situation. Hey, Sam, you know who did this. Okay, what, who is this guy? His name's John. John who? His Facebook is Rebel, John Rebel. The detective is leading Samantha to believe that she is helping them solve the mystery of what happened to Ernie, but if anything, he is becoming more and more convinced that she is lying. So now all of a sudden, why are you bringing him out? Because you know. But it was him. Because Why do you know I, it was him? I just have this feeling like it was. So law enforcement looks into this John Rebel guy. They first find out that his real name is Jonathan Sanford. For being a young guy, Jonathan has a pretty long list of run-ins with the law. In fact, at the time, he had just gotten out of jail for abusing one of his cousins. He was a pretty twisted person. It's not long before law enforcement arrests Jonathan in connection with his case. They also arrest his brother-in-law, Jose Ponche. And they were arrested because of information that Samantha finally disclosed to law enforcement. She had previously described that there were three of them, so I think law enforcement believed that there was at least one more person involved. They would also arrest a third man, Octavius Rhymes. They believed that Jonathan had reached out to Octavius to help him and Jose attack Ernie and that Octavius agreed. It doesn't take long before Jonathan starts talking about what he says started this whole mess. Basically, Samantha told Jonathan that Ernie had been mistreating their children. This angered Jonathan and made him want to do something about it. If I ever see it, or if I had to be around, or if I ever see her through the kids through the day. So, yeah, I said I'd go so Jonathan is admitting that he had threatened to hurt Ernie if he thought he was hurting Samantha or the kids. But had he actually followed through with the threat? Sounds like it. I'm gonna put you down and make sure you can't come back up and I'm gonna play. Basically, Jonathan stuck by his threat and admits he did work with the other two men to kidnap Ernie. He said that they took him out into the woods and killed him. He then led investigators to Ernie's body. Definitely did. Okay, what we need to do now. Oh yeah, he's dead, he's not gonna be alive. So now they have Ernie's body and the three men that took part in the murder locked up, but the story isn't over yet. We're gonna be, you know, checking your phone records for the last few months. Anybody that's involved in this and not connected to your phone? No. Are you sure about that? Yeah. At this point, Samantha seems pretty relaxed. Does she think she's already gotten away with all of this? Keep in mind, at this point during the questioning, she doesn't know that law enforcement has already found her husband's dead body. She thinks that as far as they know, he is just missing. Look me in the face. I need to know the truth. Did you have anything to do with Ernie's disappearance? No. Did you have anything to do with his death? No. Samantha claims that even though she complained about her husband to Jonathan and heard him threaten to hurt Ernie, she was not involved in his murder in any way. What she might not have expected was for law enforcement to take her cell phone. Where did he take that? Well, we've got a search warrant for your phone. That phone will be ours for a while. Things are just not piecing together with your story. For the first time, she is starting to seem a little concerned. Law enforcement were able to look at messages between Octavius and Samantha. They were from the night that Ernie was killed. She was telling him that he needed to shut down Ernie's phone. This was probably so that it could not be tracked. There were other messages she also sent that showed she was the clear mastermind behind all of this. No, she might not have been the one who got her hands dirty and took Ernie's life, but she planned it all out. What could be her motivation? 
I've had a lot of people stop me and ask about how I deal with things. Honestly, it's hard. It's really Samantha had Samantha wanted to be a famous YouTube star and was willing to do just about anything to make it happen. If she suddenly became the widowed mother of five, she would no doubt get a lot of the attention she was craving. Samantha was arrested and charged in connection with her husband's murder. Jonathan Sanford and Jose Ponche both pled guilty for their roles and received 50 years each. Octavius was convicted and received 98 years behind bars. Samantha's legal issues were more complicated. In trial, she tried to distance herself from the other men to make herself look better. She also claimed to have been on sleeping medication Ambien on the night that the murder took place, and she didn't remember anything that happened. But ultimately, Samantha was convicted and sentenced to 50 years for the kidnapping plot and then 99 for the murder. She appealed her convictions, but both of them were unsuccessful. This means she will be spending the rest of her life behind bars. Do you think she deserved the sentence she got? Even even though she wasn't the one who physically killed Ernie, let us know your opinion in the comments. This next case took place in Ontario, Canada. The story begins in one of the places you'd probably least expect it to be, a facility called Kerasant Care, a care home for the elderly. It had a good reputation and was supposed to provide excellent care. It was the kind of place that you were supposed to be able to trust that your loved ones would be treated right. One of the nurses there was Elizabeth Wettelofer, who had been hired in 2007. At first, she seemed to be a kind and caring nurse, but before long, she started to have some pretty major Major problems. Little temper tantrums if she didn't get something her own way. Her vibe, there was something not there. Elizabeth had a drinking problem and would sometimes show up to work drunk. One time she even was found passed out in the basement. But it wasn't just alcohol, she had problems too. Sometimes she would show up on the doorsteps of friends and co-workers and beg them for some of their own prescription medications. She said she was sick and in desperate need of help, but really she was going through withdrawals. But what was even more concerning was the fact that there were patients dying under weird and unexpected circumstances under her watch. At six o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call that my father is gone. They found him in bed, gone. That's it. And I just, I sat up in bed and I, I shook my head and I, I didn't believe it. But this was only one of the many patients to die unexpectedly. Nevertheless, this was a home for elderly people. Many of them were in their 80s or even 90s. People do sometimes pass unexpectedly at that age. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was making more and more mistakes, including giving the wrong types of medicine to the patients. By the time that they finally fired her in March of 2014, several other patients had passed away under these weird circumstances. Elizabeth had a hard Hard time keeping a job after that. She was hired at another facility, but ended up losing her position after needing to go to rehab. It was while she was receiving care for her addiction problems that she made a very disturbing confession to an old friend, John Hart. She had something she wanted to tell me, and um, she then disclosed that, well, um, somebody died because of something I did at work. I assumed it to be accidental and responded accordingly. And then she um, disclosed that it wasn't accidental. And then she disclosed that it wasn't just one. She had been purposefully killing her elderly patients by injecting them with insulin. Sometimes her attempts had not been enough to actually kill the patient, but just to make them seriously sick. But there were at least eight who died. There were six more that she attempted to kill. I'm sure at some point asked, well, why did you do this? What brought it on? She said, well, I had some anger issues that I've had to deal with, some really major anger issues. She said, I think that I was acting out my anger issues on these people. John thought that maybe what Elizabeth was saying was just a delusion or a bad dream and that she hadn't really killed any of those people, but he told her that she should go to law enforcement and confess anyway. Elizabeth didn't confess to the police, but she did then make some strange comments to a few close friends of hers. She just brought up, has police been around on my floor asking anybody questions? And I said, well, I don't know. And the other lady said, well, I think they were around and she said, to, to us, well, I like police in uniform and they don't scare me at all. And that was odd. 
And then, just days later, Elizabeth had been arrested, and the news of what she had done broke. That a nurse had involvement in the murder of eight elderly patients. Now, some of the family members were learning that their loved ones had not died of natural causes after all, but of murder. My father's passing was so abrupt and unforeseen. It's destroyed. It's destroyed our family. I don't, in, in my eyes, this, it, it'll never be right. The elderly couple should be able to pass when the time is right, not because a sick and twisted nurse decided to snuff their lives out early. Then he got shortchanged out of life. That's not fair. That's, that's, just, that's just the raw end of the deal. I went to the cemetery for a year. For one year, I went to the cemetery every day almost because I missed him that much. Let's see if I love you. Elizabeth had been charged with eight murders, but convicting her was going to be a challenge because many of the patients had died years previously. Several of the victims had also been cremated long ago. Even if the investigators were to dig up the victims that were buried, they wouldn't be able to find the insulin Elizabeth used within their bodies because it happened so long ago. Ultimately though, she made it easy for the prosecution because she confessed everything to detectives and took full responsibility. She even went into detail about what she would tell the patients while she was in the process of killing them. His reaction to it? He fought it. Did he? Yeah. Did he fought everything? Did you ever speak to these people when you were rejecting them? No. Did you ever say anything to them? Not much they asked me what I was doing, then I just say it was a great one. She admitted that she had always known right from wrong, but made the decision to kill these people anyway. Elizabeth said the killings never brought her any sense of pleasure afterward. I felt horrible. I felt angry at myself. I felt like I had failed myself. I felt like God had failed me. I went to the pastor and told him what had happened. And his wife was there too. And they prayed over me. And they said to me, now this is God's grace. She also acknowledged that there were no words that were going to soothe the pain the families of the victims were going through. What can you say to them that would matter? Um, I'm sorry, isn't enough. I should have gotten help sooner. Elizabeth was convicted and sentenced to eight consecutive life terms in prison, one for each life that she took. She will be eligible for parole after 25 years behind bars. Today, we are learning new details about the woman accused of killing her father and six-year-old daughter in Florida. That woman, Cheyenne Jesse, grew up in both Walker and Catoosa counties. Cheyenne Jesse of Florida was a young single mom who had a daughter named Meredith. Meredith struggled with some pretty severe behavioral problems and didn't like listening to authority figures. Cheyenne's father, Mark Weekly, often helped her with Meredith, and Meredith would usually behave for him better than he would for her. In August of 2019, law enforcement were called to a rental home that was said to belong to Mark Weekly. They were called there after getting a report about missing people. When they got there, Cheyenne greeted them. She told deputies that she had dropped Meredith off with her dad weeks earlier, and he later sent her a text telling her that he had cancer. He told her that he was taking Meredith with him to Georgia to stay with family, and he wasn't coming back. Jesse's family got a call from her on July 28th, saying her dad and daughter were missing to cover up the murder, but her stories didn't match up. But this story didn't make much sense to family members. Supposedly, Mark was supposed to have cancer. She couldn't answer which doctor he went to see, what kind of cancer. Since she was supposedly the last person to have talked to Mark, detectives took Cheyenne in for questioning. They talked to her about her relationship with her daughter, and Cheyenne admitted that things with Meredith weren't very good. I know that your daughter has issues. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you classify your, you and your daughter's relationship 10 being the best? Um... <clears throat> I was trying to make it at least an eight, but she. But realistically, you know, it has to be five. five. Cheyenne had a special man in her life at the time. His name was Matthew Monroe, but he went by Cody. Apparently, Cody was getting pretty tired of having to deal with Meredith's extreme behavioral problems. So do you think that, having said that, do you think it's better for you and your relationship with Matthew if she's with your dad full time? Um, well, we've actually been able to focus on our relationship instead of 
I'll constantly work looking over her shoulder at what she's gonna do next, what she's gonna destroy. So basically it sounds like Cheyenne was totally okay with her dad just keeping her daughter. But this still doesn't explain how the two of them just disappeared without anyone else knowing. Detectives went inside of Mark's house and quickly found some pretty concerning things. There was a couch that had been covered with a sheet and underneath there was a blood splatter. There was also a strong smell of body decomposition and dead flies everywhere. Detectives also found Mark's wallet and some medicine that had been prescribed to Meredith. These are things that would not have been left behind. This is when they began to suspect that Meredith and Mark could have been killed. This stuff doesn't make, make sense. Before long, Cheyenne realized that her lies weren't working, so she tried making up a different story. She admitted that Meredith and Mark were dead and that she had killed them, but claimed that it had all been a matter of self-defense. She said she and her dad had gotten into a fight and she grabbed a weapon to defend herself, eventually killing him. She said that during all of this, little Meredith ran towards her and got killed in the process. Obviously, Cheyenne wasn't the best at making up very convincing stories. Law enforcement searched Mark's property, and in a shed out back, they found both his and Meredith's dead bodies wrapped in plastic bags. They had both been clearly attacked and suffered severe wounds. Cheyenne was arrested and charged with both of their murders. It was easy for the prosecution to put together what the motive was in this situation. Cheyenne didn't want to be a mom. She wanted to focus on her relationship with her boyfriend. She had even asked her dad to just take Meredith on a full-time basis before, but he wasn't willing to do that. So she found a way to get them both out of the picture at the same time. Cheyenne's defense said that she struggled with bipolar disorder and that she had been abused as a young child, but this was not enough to convince a jury of her innocence. Cheyenne was ultimately convicted for both of the murders. A jury recommended that she should pay with her life for her daughter's murder, but she was ultimately given in two life sentences instead. This was a crime that shocked both Cheyenne's family and the community. We were friends. We went to three years of middle school together. Polly Bridges tells us how Jessie acted in school back then. She was uh, a little strange, but I didn't know what she had the bipolar then, but she was a little strange. There has been so many things that weren't adding up that Cheyenne had said. But now that she had been convicted of both murders, it all made sense, as shocking as it was. It just all started falling back into place, all the comments and everything that she had said before. But for Jesse's former classmate, Polly Bridges, this was a big surprise. I was shocked because I couldn't believe it. She did it. She was, she was friendly too in school and quiet, and I just couldn't believe she did it. Do you think that Cheyenne should have to pay with her life for killing her dad and little Meredith? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.